We're going to be talking about Escher. I do recommend these two books. Either one of those are very well worth having. Beautiful pictures in them. This is actually a, a second uh, broadcast about Escher. His art is very mathematical and he had insights which were truly genius. Uh, he was a genius when it came to being able to see the geometry and in in shapes and the way they fitted together and filled space. Uh, he was, as a young man, he went to uh, Alhambra, the palace in Granada, which was set up by the Moors uh, when they ruled Spain. They were a very cultured society far ahead of the rest of people in Europe. And they explored quite a lot of mathematics and amongst those things um, were these patterns, these 17 patterns that fill space. And the pattern you see above um, is one of the patterns from Alhambra. Now, here you have a notebook in uh, a note from uh, Escher, where he explains a little bit about how shapes fit together. And what you see there is a lot of triangles and you might look and you be, might be able to see a hexagon in there made up of six triangles. But why Escher made this note for himself was he was noting three geometrical transformations, we call them. One where points just move along a line and A, the arrow that goes from A to B, shows you that that whole pattern can shift along horizontally. The mathematical word is translate. And the whole pattern will move uh, to look exactly as it is now, but move to the right. You can make the pattern stay the same by doing a reflection where P goes to Q. And that line that's dotted and dashed, that was a note to say that there is a reflection in that horizontal line through A, B and C, where P is reflected in that mirror and goes to Q. And then the third note he makes there is about rotations, where the whole, the whole plane can rotate so that the line that goes through C, the sort of thick line that goes through C, rotates anti-clockwise. Oh, that looked clockwise, I think. I'm not sure. Anti-clockwise, anyway, through 60 degrees. And, of course, yeah. it rotates the it, other way. It's anti-clockwise. Yes, it, and it rotates minutes, yeah. the other way. So it, you know, can, it can go either way. The gesture oh, I made with my hand. Oh, your hand. Oh, yeah. Was doing hand. the other thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just use both and say, well, it's going to go one way or the other. No, no, I was doing it. <laughs> I understand. I was doing it. Hence, well, you both, mind. and then you know one of them's right. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. But one okay. thing I love about Escher is that he was, can we can go back to that one just for a moment, Tony? He did not consider himself to be a mathematician. He thought, well, I'm not a mathematician. And he considers himself to be less than the mathematicians that he worked with. And yet, well, this is a basic thing that we learn in higher primary, lower, secondary, the, these transformations and rotations and mirror symmetries. But he used these concepts, as you will see shortly, with some very, very complex mathematical ideas. So he had, it was the, he had the, the mind of a mathematician, if not the formal training of one. So what he did was he explored 17 different groups of transformations. And by that, I mean, as we've just talked about them, reflections, and glide reflections, rotations, and translations. And that will copy the plane uh, nature again to look just the same, but to be changed by one of those transformations. And copies of a shape fill the plane. He was very interested in uh, filling the plane with repetitions of the same shape. So here you see black and white birds filling the plane. And here this plane was actually around, wrapped around a column. So it was like on the surface of a, a, a um, cylinder. But here we're just going to see some glimpse of these 17 uh, different groups. We're not going to go into the maths in detail. Now, here's another note made by him 
um, of, uh, here he has done a design of these little men with the pointed caps, um, and the men are sort of whitish and dark gray and light gray, you can see them. And that's, again, if you look, you can see triangles there, that's based on a tessellation or putting together of triangles. That was quite early on, 1938. Now this is beautiful, it's called Sun and Moon. Now, when you look at it, you may see the gray birds with the sun behind them. And then if you look again, you may see the white, orange, red birds with the night sky behind them. I think you need to leave, leave this on for a little bit longer, Tony, because it took me a while to spot it. I could see because the sun is red and yellow and that had me a bit transfixed. You can see the rays of the suns are coming out red and yellow. The moon and the and the and the, the not just the moon is the, the the night sky is in the gray. So if you look at the coloring of the the gray birds, that's where you see the moon in the center. To see the night sky, you've got to look at the white birds and then the the night sky is behind them. To see the day sky, you've got to see you've got to look at the grey birds and the, the day, day, daylight is behind them. See, I, I'm seeing, see, that's why I see it the other way around. I actually have to look, everyone's got their own way of looking at things. So Tony's said one way, I've said another, but I had to look at the grey birds, uh, into the detail of the grey birds in order to see the, the night sky. So, so well, you, you, one, you, you, works for you, but it's there, so have it. But, but the point is the grey birds are supposed to be flying in the daytime and you're not supposed to look at the, uh, with, with the with the sun behind them. And the white birds are supposed to be flying at night with the night sky behind them. But okay, you're, right. You, yeah, you, I see what I see your point. <laughs> but, you, but, but isn't that interesting? Different people yeah. see different things. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, this was a woodcut, if you're interested in the craft behind it, which means that he carved it with blocks and wooden blocks, and then they were dipped in the colours, and he's using quite a number of different colours there, and um, printed. It must have been done so precisely for them to fit together as they do, because there are different shaped birds there, and they're all fitting beautifully together. But it's a, it's a tessellation. Now here is something you might like to try for yourselves. Um, you can cut out any triangle out of card, any angles will do. And then if you're careful, you can keep drawing around the edge of your triangle, moving it along, drawing around it again, and matching the edges and make what we call a tessellation. Now tessellation is where the same shape fits together again and again and covers the flat space, the plane. And you can do that with any triangle. So typical also, tessellation would be tiles on a floor or tiles on a wall. They tessellate. They completely cover the wall, completely cover the floor. And, and tessellation is an art in of itself. And Escher just took it to another level, didn't he? Mathematically speaking, there's a difference between tessellation and tiling. But Caroline's quite right. Um, there, then you but, see... But, but wait, but, but aren't square tiles... Don't square tiles tessellate? They do, of course, yes. So I, I should have specified square tiles. No, mathema a... no, you shouldn't, Caroline. No. Mathematically, tessellation and tiling are slightly different. And um, the difference is that um, tessellation is according to, um, it, 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 it's according to a pattern which repeats itself. Now, the, the, what you described as a, a tiling is a tessellation, but not all tilings are tessellation. Right, fair enough. I, there's no problem there. I was imagining plain white tiles, as it were, just covering a wall, and they're all the same shape. They're all squares. Um, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so that's so. So yes, be careful, everybody. I just no, no, you don't have to well. know. It's not. It's. It, I, yeah. I, it's I, I just learned something new, which is great. I've learned something. Another new thing today. Um. So. Uh, yeah. Okay, so 
quadrilaterals also tessellate. So you can do the same thing with a quadrilateral and uh, any quadrilateral, and you can fit copies of it, and you can use it as a cardboard quadril quadrilateral as a template. And then, this is just the sort of thing, but much, much, much more um, detailed that Escher did. By taking your basic shape, let's look at the triangle now, you can take a little bite out of it, okay, and you can make a, you can add that same shape uh, to the uh, edge on the other side um, to get to, 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 you take the bite out and you put it back on the other side and then you have changed your triangle now into a five-sided shape, but your bite doesn't need to have straight edges. Think of doing a jigsaw puzzle, you know, the standard jigsaw puzzle. That's got a rounded piece or lots of rounded pieces that stick out and other rounded pieces into which they fit. And am I right in saying you can do this on the other two edges as well? Any edges. And you any can any make... of the edges. And yes. this, is, this, is, this boggles my mind. And I even had tr difficulty, Tony. I, 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 didn't, I knew that squares tessellate, that triangles tessellate, although I was kind of kind of a bit fixated on regular triangles where all the equi equilateral where all the edges are the same length all the angles are the same i'm like well that's obvious they tessellate but and tony said no any shape triangle i'm like really and then any shape quadrilateral so where was me after that i was off cutting out all these bits and different shapes and making them all the same of course once you've cut one out you then you've got they've all got to be exactly the same shape and it's just a matter of how they fit together it's not it's not whether they fit together, they do. It's the, it's, and this then is the next bit that we're going to cover, but it's like, and then, and then you cut the bits out of it and you add the bits in and they're, as long as they're, they're the same shape, they, they all tessellate, blows my mind. And but then you see, my, my well. Caroline, my challenge to people is to look at this slide and take a basic shape like a triangle or a quadrilateral and draw around it. You only need to cut one out of card. Take a piece of paper, keep drawing around that same, use it as a template, keep drawing around it. Make your grid and then start being creative. Can you make a bird? Can you make the wings stick out? Um, and then can you make it so that it will then repeat itself and and the bits that stick out will fit into something that's a little bit of a hollow somewhere else, and you make your design. It'll take quite a lot of experimentation, but you, if, you're a, if you like this sort of artwork, then there's a challenge for you. And you'll, I'm sure you'll come to it, respect and admire Escher even more for the wonderful designs that he made, because it's not easy to do it. And yeah, don't don't. And the, I was the reason I was going back a step, Tony, is because I found it hard to believe. I mean, I I, I took mm. your word for it, but I had to do it for myself before but I the actually next, saw the it next, for myself. Yeah. Yes, Caroline. But the next thing, which I don't want to go into here because we've got lots more pictures to talk about and show. But the next thing with this is, you tried it by doing it practically, but then somebody else or maybe you too would like to try it by proving it geometrically why does it happen i'm going to leave it there because i want to move on and here we have another design now here this is actually a design which has got six edges and it's sort of got kinks pushed into it at the side like a waist from x to y okay and there's the details, which I'm not going to read, and you can read for yourself, which show you how to make that shape, starting with the easy shape, the parallelogram, K-L-M-N, okay? And if you make that shape, you can tessellate with it. So, so to tessellate copies of this irregular hexagon, You'll need to rotate the shapes about the midpoints of the edges. And all I'm saying is try it. I'm not asking that you 
can see it now at this minute, but it's there for you. You'll be able to um, have access to the, this recording of our show today. And we'll also post um, the PDF, which will give you all the slides with these things on. So if you're interested, you can try it for yourselves. Now here you see some more tilings of hexagons. And um, so we're using color here. They're all hexagons, but the three patterns and each pattern has a different shaped hexagon. And we're asking here, what's the smallest shape that repeats itself just by translations to fill the plane? Not by rotations, not by reflections, but just picking the, pushing the thing along and moving it to the next thing, the copy of itself. Yeah. Now, the one on the left, the reason we've got four colors there is that if you focus on, start at the top left-hand corner, if you like, and you focus on the green, yellow, pink, and mauve copies of that shape, it's all the same shape, but if you focus on those four copies, then you see you can move one green one along to the next one, and then that will take with it the yellow one and the pink one and the mauve one. And you can do that by moving it down as well. So when you count round that shape, which is made up of four hexagons, you'll see it's got 14 edges. And you can use that to tessellate or tile the plane. And here the same thing applies. And here we've got, oh, oh by the way, the reason it's called periodic is means that you can do it over and over and over again. We've only shown you a few copies here, but you could go on forever out and as far as you like and use it as wallpaper to cover your whole wall. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to see that on the wall every day, but there you are. <laughs> These are called wallpaper patterns, by the way. The one in the middle has only got two. So actually, if you take the pair, the green and mauve pair, you can move them down or you can move them across and you see it keeps repeating itself. And the one on the right has got three colors. And if you look at the shape made up of three colors, there, there are five copies of it and it, then it does again. The tiny. It's like okay. a stamp. Yes, yes. You can see where you, you could, the stamp what, that repeats itself, locate, find the, the, the basic form and that's, that's your mm. stamp. And the, the, yes, and the, and you you've seen you've seen these sorts of patterns in many places. They're commonly called wallpaper patterns by mathematicians, but you've seen them on fabrics, on curtains, on um, dress materials, as well as wallpaper. You've seen them, as Caroline mentioned, as tiles on the patio, on the floor, on bathroom walls. Many, many places you'll see these repeating patterns. Okay, so t you'll see amongst our, our um, pictures we're showing, Esha's pictures we're showing, you'll see more of these tessellations. But he, he explored other mathematical ideas. He explored the idea of spirals here. And spirals on a, a flat plane, like the red and brown fishes there, but also spirals that went round and round on, in, on, around the edge of a, a donut shape. You can't see the whole shape. I like the one on the right, um, that one, the spirals go round and twist round in a ring, but as you go round, the ring gets bigger. That's fascinating, isn't it's, it? It's, it's, as I said, he had the mind of a mathematician, if not the training of one. It absolutely mind-boggling. But it's, you know, it's, they're beautiful to look at too. And no. this one, this one is one of is one of my favourites because these are all shapes that I work with with balloons. So I <laughs> love this one. Now these are called the Platonic solids. Okay, and there you see the five ones, the five shapes that are sketched down the middle, um, and um, the, the, they were discussed 
by the Greeks, and, and he it was Plato, as name has been attached to them. Um, and as Caroline does a lovely entertainment where she makes these out of balloons. Um, but uh, Escher has played with these shapes, and he's made this. This is his from his notebook on the left there where he's made, he's written in the names of these shapes, so you can read them there. And, <laughs> and here on the right, you've got this um, cube octahedron and, and these funny creatures inside it. <laughs> and their tail wrapped around the edges of it. Uh, isn't it, isn't it amazing? That, well, I, that's not a cube octahedron, Tony, but... I think it is. Okay, it is. right. Well, we'll have a discussion later, not right now. <laughs> a cube octahedron has... Uh, you can see the squares there. What, what I see is two octahedra inside each other. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a two two octahedron rather than a cube octahedron. That's exactly what you see, yes. And if you see it's up on the left-hand side just under the bubbly mass it's labeled there caroline and that's the solid one and the right hand one where the beasties are is is in just a skeleton oh it's a three octahedra then there's three of them <laughs> now we're going on to um his exploration of two and three dimensions and um, this is a very famous one where you see probably they're his hands sketching his arm which is now dissolved into the paper so you've got the flat piece of paper with the hands coming out of course it's all flat but and, and yet and, and yet the flat piece of paper doesn't even look flat the flat piece of paper looks as though it's it's you know it's having to it's had to stick the piece of paper down with tacks because it's coming away <laughs> from the from the desk it's absolutely <laughs> incredible now look at these, these are amazing. So in this one on the left, which is called Encounter, the encounters are between sort of little men and little black beastie things with big noses, okay? <laughs> and they've come out of the picture behind and... Which is flat, it's flat at uh, the back. And like they've come out... And look pretty solid in the front. Mm. Uh, I mean, mm. that's just amazing. He called it encounter. And the thing, and the one on the right is even more amazing. And they show you how he was exploring mathematics. So he's got these reptiles, um, lizards or crocodiles. They don't look fierce like crocodiles. Anyway, they're flat on the page of the book, and then they're crawling out of the page crawling up over the book and then there's a ramp which is a trapezium shape onto the solid shape which is a dodecahedron and over into that sort of cup and then down and slithering down back into the flat page again isn't that i just noticed it, it's like a wingless dragon because one of them's actually blowing smoke or steam out of its nose right at the top there i don't oh, even know so he that. is so he is <laughs> but they're fantasy creatures <laughs> And and he's the, the cactus is sort of a ball there, a sphere, not quite, but more or less. He's also put a cylinder, two cylinders in the front with the bottle and the drink the glass there. I and mean, he like a and it's it's just absolutely the detail and what the thought that's gone into that. Is just well, he's 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 obviously exploring some shapes uh, and mathematical and for me the shapes are, are mathematical ideas okay so that's exploring two and three dimensions now this gets more and more oh mind-blowing here we have got impossible worlds he called them and it the thing about this is if you look at a little piece of it it looks perfectly okay. Nothing impossible about, if you just look around the corner of one of the corners of the crate or one of the corners of the tri bar, it looks all right. But when you look at the whole thing, you realize it's impossible. And he played with that idea. And um, uh, Roger Penrose is a mathematician, he's a professor at Oxford. Well, he's retired now, he's sort of about my age. And um, 
Yes, he and Escher did quite a lot of work on, on this sort of thing, uh, on tiling too. Um, Roger did a lot of um, research on tiling. Now we've got some of Escher's pictures in Possible words, Worlds. And this one is called Send, Ascending and Descending. This is one of the most famous ones that, that he's, that I've seen this repeatedly, and it's, it's absolutely bonkers. If you look at the top, that sort of the, the staircase that goes round on the roof there, near the roof, uh, in a, around a quadrangle, I mean, the, when you look at it, you can't be sure. I mean, some of the people appear to be going down, other people ap appear to be going up, but it's a continuous staircase. So, so oh, it's just mind blowing. So it's, it, it's impossible, but it's it's just it's so mesmerizing looking at it. You know, well, it's you, going on forever, and you just don't. Stop. <laughs> and then you go the other way, and oh, they're all going down, and they're all going up. Wait a minute, they're going next to each other, and it just never ends. It's amazing. Well, actually, the crate was a clue, wasn't it? He obviously used the idea of a crate, which you've just seen. In helping him to make that design and oh, impossible. Yes, but, I still you know. don't know how he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do I. Now, this one again, I, you find actually it's even harder to see the contradictions here. Here, this is called Belvedere with the lady with a long tr a train there and a funny hat with horns and at the and bottom. Th this one, he's actually it's it's it is deceptive because the top layer, as far as I can see. It's just normal. It's got three domes and it's got each dome has four, four, well, yeah, four columns, whatever. I think once you begin to but, look at the columns, you begin to wonder. But, but it, not, on, not on the top layer, though. Okay. On the top layer, I don't see, apart from the one column at the back is a little bit not wide enough, perhaps. But no, the top column, I think the top layer, I think is okay. I haven't seen any. But that's deceptive because then you look at the middle layer where the man's standing hold looking away in towards the mountains and the, the where the ladder the, be, the ladder begins look at that layer look at the 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 columns and the arches on that one and tell me how that can happen <laughs> it can't it's impossible <laughs> now this one is uh, just uh, again uh, it's just intriguing um you have two versions of the a uh, woman looking out the window and the man on the staircase looking up at her. But it, 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 in the picture, they appear to be drawn looking at different, in at different angles. And if you look at the top and bottom, well, Caroline was telling me this afternoon that she looks at the middle, but I tend to look at the top half and the bottom half. And, uh, and it's like a spot the difference game. But they all merge into each other in the middle, which makes this sort of impossible pattern they're, they're, in the middle. They're, they're a copy of each other. The top and the bottom are a copy of each other. Let's say they're looking at the same thing from two different perspectives. But, but the fact that they're all in the same picture, I suppose in this day and age, we have those those ro those rotational, you know, you can see 360 degrees, but 360 degrees isn't going to give you two copies of the same thing. It's just going to see, let you see all the way around it. So what I saw was that in the center, the little patio area in the center, you have one the same building coming out upside down, whereas mm -hmm. one building's coming up the right way up, the other one's coming upside down. It just whatever, whichever way you look at it, you can see different things and different perspectives. And it's, it's again, a bit like it's somehow a bit like when you go into these halls and mirrors with distorting mirrors and it makes you look really odd everything around looks odd you can just go back to the other one again there's a sort of third thing happening and that is on the right the column on the right it's been connected to the the picture on the bottom with arches and you can see the the the, the identical one on top is connecting to it with arches so it's been connected at, at the bottom and at the top and you can't even see it it's happening but you can't even see the that third column that third building um, or uh, second building, whatever it is. There's so many questions around it. I mean, I would, I would, I think, find that quite disturbing to have on the wall. But uh, there are some of the more peaceful ones, like the sun and the moon. Are, are well, this is very, this is intriguing as well. Um, but I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not sure I'd hang it on my wall. Maybe now this one is called relativity, and here. 
again, you've got a stair, an impossible staircase. Okay, is it? But now, as you've got, you've now you've got people un, going up under and coming down underneath, and stairs on the top as well. Uh, oh my goodness! I feel this inspired Hogwarts. I think this is where Hogwarts came from. <laughs> and Magic. You know, I think you've got people walking horizontally. You've got people. Sit, there's one person sitting on the wall facing down and I don't actually see anyone upside down but there's definitely people sitting horizontally and just I just I just what I do is I imagine what on earth was going on in this man's head how on earth <laughs> no he's deliberately no he's been deliberately um perverse he's he's actually seeing how crazy he can make it because he's making an impossible world yeah no, it's uh, i mean in, the, in this world you've got floors which people are walking on which are actually walls and walls which are floors oh it's crazy and they well, are the actually walls as well as floors yeah it's beautiful this one is a water it calls waterfall and here the water is flowing continuously but is it flowing up? It appears to be on that zigzag and then coming down on the waterfall, which is going straight down. I mean, it's just crazy, isn't it? It's just wonderful how, mm -hmm. how, how he can actually make it look like that. Okay, so escaping from the impossible world, <laughs> we come into the world of knots. Now, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, Did you say that on purpose? Yes. Knots, okay. <laughs> not the, whole, the theory of knots is a, 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 a mathematical area of research. It is it's called it, knot it, theory, strangely. Yes, and it's, it's, it it's, wonderful, it's wonderful playing with people that study knots. There's a gentleman yeah, from yeah, Ireland. Yeah, yeah. My, my, husband, my husband now, he's retired. He used to have his own office, but he now has an office that he shares with somebody um, called Ray, who's who's a knot theorist, and so in my husband's office, he's got pictures of knots on the wall. <laughs> okay, so um, Escher explored knots too, and and he and he did some knots in his uh, artwork. There's knots. Okay. Now this one is it. We're going to spend a little a little time on this because isn't it amazing? C here? Can I just can I just fill in the bit that I missed when I first looked at it? This is actually this is a long one long picture that starts on the top left and then it continues on the one below it is the next one the one below it's the next one the one below it's the next one and then the next four. Other fall, uh, other fall as it continues, but this is actually pictures of one very, very one seven meter long um, picture, and each and it's it's been divided into eight segments. Well, in it, to it, we, it here. yeah, exactly. So the depth of it is about that deep between my two hands. Okay, yeah. it's just less than twenty centimeters, but it's seven meters long. That's huge. Uh, and here you'll see, you, you, you sort of read it like a book, really. So as you read along the top piece where you've got the word metamorphose in grey, it becomes a regular, pretty much a regular checker pattern, which then becomes a little bit wobbly and into a beehive pattern. And you actually see some small these there but they're, they're, they're pretty vague and some more later on and then it goes back again or maybe that's a bit of the pattern repeated actually well, I don't know because it does go into the beehive it goes into hexagonal stars you know start, no yeah. five pentagonal which means you've got yeah. some and then so, it goes back to squares and then it and then it goes after that, it goes into the hexagons. Yes. So the thing about it is, if you, yes, you're right, Caroline. So if, is everybody, if, if you're looking at this, you need to look at um, each time go down one um, yeah. to start see the start, next start one. Left and then go down. One, uh, and two, then you three, go four, down the then... left hand foot four. Yeah. And then you start at the top again with the fish 
the hats and the fish and go down yeah. the right hand for. Yeah. So going across the second strip on the left, you see the, the checkerboard again, and then that goes That's into it some... Like, they're almost snowflakes, aren't they? But they're snowflakes with bees on them. So They've got they're, little they're frogs there. They can, oh, you can see frogs. frogs, yes. Oh, yes, before the hexagons, between the, the squares. It's, mm. Yeah, it, it, he does a frog and then and turns into that kind of lizard kind of things, and then frogs, and then turtles, and then hexagons. Okay. And then the hexagons make a beehive again, and now we've got bigger, more d clearer bees. Right, and then they're flying, and the bees become birds, and then they merge with the fishes who are swimming the other way. You can still see the black birds, though. Yeah, the birds keep going, don't they, for quite long, and then they become, yeah. they almost become whales a bit later, maybe not. And then, no, and then, the, sort then of, the white they, becomes a hat, the, the white part of it become hats. Yes, uh, the, the, the birds, which are black, as you say, I'm not sure whether they're whales, but they certainly look more like um, th swimming things than they do. Mm. Yes. So then you've got the, um, the hats, and then you go to the top again, and the hats are mixed up with more fish. And as you keep going right, the fish suddenly the gaps between the horses. It's and like, then you see horses. Where did they come from? <laughs> and then they almost look like goats. Further on, they, the horses turn into goats. Yes. And then the birds appear again. In fact, they, initially, when you see the goats, that kind of looks like they look like phoenixes. They kind of look like firebirds in between the, the what looks to me like goats. And then the birds turn into triangles. And then it's like uh, uh, almost origami birds in that next section. <laughs> but birds are flying out then. You've got, you've got a sort of, in this second one down on the right, you've got a, sort of a suggestion of a, a triangular tessellation behind. But there's some, yes, there's some birds on the left. There's sort of different shaped birds and, and then more birds on the right. I'm going to call them origami birds. I think <laughs> they just like origami birds to me. But then they turn into real birds, don't they? And then you've got the black birds turning then turning into white or merging with white. They, they look more like flowers and birds then at that point. And then it begins to get three-dimensional because you then mm. get blocks, which then become a city. Which is completely random because that that, that is not um any kind of tessellation is it and yet it's beautiful it's extraordinary you've got the fields at the bottom which end up being it's actually a cube tony look at that the, the chessboard is actually a cube shape well uh, what is so clever is there's a sort of bridge from the city to something which looks like a tower but then it's actually a night yes that's no, a, it's not a knight, it's a castle. Uh, a, a castle, yeah. Uh, or uh, a queen, uh, it could be a queen. It looks actually look more like a queen. That, no, that oh, well, it could be actually. Anyway, mm. it's on the chessboard. It's the tower, uh, but the queen does look like a tower. So yes, and then it, then the, then you, you've got it as three-dimensional, but then it flattens out. Well, you've just got a, um, a checkerboard, and then, you, then you're at the bottom and then it fades away into the grey and the word metamorphose again. Yeah, it just ends the way it began. It's absolutely incredible. Now, this idea of metamorphosis, which means change your, sh sh your form, your shape, you see it's there, that's what he's exploring, how one shape gradually changes into another. And this is this is something that's very commonly is a common thing these days with CGI. Morphing happens all the time with cartoons these days, and even with with real life characters, because using CGI, people actors can be transformed into something completely different using computer graphics. But it's the same principle. They're morphing, it and it's exactly yes. the same principle as. But Escher had to do it with pen and ruler and paper and look at what he did without any computers at all but if you get if you get somebody in a um, <laughs> an animation 
a, a lot of films, not just cartoons, but of people, right, are not filmed as you see them. It's cheaper to get the cinema, the, the, the technical people to take a picture of Caroline and make her walk. With a green screen behind. <laughs> I don't know, but the point is, if you were a film star who charged, you know, it might be cheaper to make the software actually make you walk rather than having you all day walking around doing the things. You I mean, you would be an actor on the stage, but at times, especially yeah, at times they the um, software engineers create the moving pictures by making a series of small changes, morphing the picture, so it looks as if the person or the whatever it is, the vehicle or whatever it is, is actually moving. But or, is, or, they, or they replicate like when there's especially when there's crowds titanic was the first one there where this was famously done the scene in titanic where the ship was sailing out of southampton harbor and everyone was waving that was cgi that yeah. was that wasn't real and the, with all these battle scenes lord of the rings a lot of the the aviation scenes these days and bombings and it's all cgi and they're doing and especially when there's a a lot of crowds or a lot of airplanes in the sky it's the same principle yes and it's and it's so many pictures that you think you're seeing something continuous what you're actually seeing is such a small change that you don't recognize the change and what Met escher is showing you here is actually you can see the change but you know he, 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 he's not putting all the many stages in between but it's well, the map originally the movies were called the reason why they're called movies is because they are moving pictures there are lots of stills, orig the very original ones were simply still pictures, literally drawn still. And cartoons, originally the um, Disney cartoons, were all stills that are just filmed at a, at a rate so that the human eye, look, they look as though they're moving to the human eye. So the mathematician um, is, it studies this, or is sort of it's part of, it's very mathematical programming, the CGI. That's really what I'm trying to say. And it's all to do with this continuous change. And also these ideas that we've been talking about, about reflection, rotation and translation. Those groups of transformations are all built into the computer program that, 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 that is used to make these films. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, it's all, there's a lot of mathematics in it. Um, and here, well, here you can see I'm not sure whether he was, he thought of films and animation in films, but he was certainly thinking of an artwork to put on the wall to explore these ideas. Mm. She was thinking that. And we see them in other, in other works that he's done. Now here you see this, which is called Sky and Water. And here you see the gray birds at the top of blackish gray birds right and as you go down they get darker and they then merge into the dark water at the bottom and as you look at if you start looking at the fish at the bottom which is a distinctly a fish and go up looking at the fishes the fishes change and then they lose their shape and at the top they become the sky and there you have the metamorphosis of the fish into the sky and the birds into the water. Those are clearly geese. Just I'm very happy to actually see a bird I recognise. Those are geese. <laughs> the top one is anyway. <laughs> but the thing it's nice because he's chosen both fit, both geese. Well, I don't know. Uh, fish don't do it quite so much, but geese do fly in that triangular formation. So it's really nice that he's used geese because that is a very na natural form for them. <laughs> That's metamorphosis again. Now the next one, he's uh, this is whole idea of Mobius bands. We use this um, with children just to begin to get them to think a bit about a, an area of mathematics that's called topology. But this is just baby stuff, really, to take the Mobius band. But what um, Escher has done with this Mobius band 
he's actually merged it in the middle where he's done this tessellation of horsemen, <clears throat> the gray horseman and the orange horse, orange red horseman fitting together. And he's, he's actually, again, he's exploring uh, the flat two dimensions and the th coming out into three dimensions. So in the middle, he's flattened it and then, although it's all two dimensional, of course, but he's very cleverly given, suggested the three dimensions because you need three dimensions for the Mobius band. Mm. It's amazing, that I love it. And here you've got some more Mobius bands. Okay. Um, uh, the one on the right with the insects on it, that one has just got one twist. So what you do to make a Mobius band is you take a strip of paper and you do one twist and then glue the piece together. So you make a continuous half. That does what, and it's a nice thing to experiment with. If you literally, if you loop together, a, a loop and just make a cylinder basically, one loop, then you can draw on the inside and you've got one line that, that one starts surface. And ends here, one surface. But yes, but if you draw, you've got one line that joins back together with itself. And you draw on the outside, you've got another line that draws draws um, back together on itself. And so you've got two lines, two surfaces, two lines. Then you twist, one twist. And do the same again. That's a Mobius start band. Here, start here and start drawing right down the center and see what happens. So glue that together to make it easy for yourself. And do that and see what happens. Now, if you look at the insects, right, you'll see that some of them are inside the band. But as they go round, the inside becomes the outside. And then they're on the outside. And then they get into the inside again. Um, and as Caroline just explained to you, if you imagine drawing a line, I didn't explain the second part though. I let ah, well, they can do that, they themselves. Find out for themselves. Is yeah. that an optical illusion or can we actually do that in real life? Can we make one path for the ants in real life? So, Mobius strip one on the left, right, has got two twists in it before you glue it together again. So, that's another nice one to experiment with. So, we started off with no twists and then I said, do one twist now and, and draw the line or cut it in half that's another really interesting thing do this with now i'm going to give it an additional twist which is what the one in the middle is it doesn't quite look like that because it's made out of paper but this has got two twists in it then what's going to happen how many surfaces have we got this time <laughs> okay so he was yes he was looking at and making his sort of artistic um, representation of these mobius strips fascinating thank you so much everybody see you next week for greater understanding and enjoyment of mathematics the maths toys youtube channel is brought to you by aimsec and the aiming high website in the description you will find a link to our home learning guide for ages 4 to 18 and a teacher resource pack if you find this video useful there is a gofundme link in the description to donate to and support aimsec the money goes to bursaries for professional development for teachers in disadvantaged communities around the world. Subscribe, comment and ding the notification bell to make sure you don't miss our latest